If everyone find them a seat, it's six o'clock and we'll begin our service. I want to welcome everyone to our evening service here at the Richmond Church of Christ. Uh, welcome to everyone at home uh, who's watching us over the networks. Uh, and we're glad to see all of you here tonight. Uh, if you have any new visitors, be sure to stay around and give us a chance to get to know you. And we hope that you come back and hope you get a blessing from tonight's service. We'll begin our service with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're truly thankful for this day and for the many, uh, many blessings that you've given us through life. We're thankful, dear Heavenly Father, for life. And we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus, who came to this earth to die, to give us that life. We pray now for our, our sick um, and too many right now to mention. We pray to Heavenly Father that they might receive a blessing from our service, that they might be uplifted. And we pray that you will look down upon them with your healing. We ask you to go with us through the, this day and the remainder part of this day, uh, watch over us. We ask that if there be anyone in our midst tonight who doesn't know you, that tonight might be the night that they step out in the aisle and walk down and accept you all they need to do is make that first step, and Jesus will walk with you the rest of the way. Watch over us, guide us, and keep us. Forgive us most of all we might have failed you, and we'll give you all the praise in your sweet son's name. Amen. Thank you. 
experienced true harassment? I referee college football. I, I, I've experienced a little bit of, of true harassment now and then. The thought came to my mind this morning as we were preparing for the Lord's Supper. Uh, in Isaiah 53 and verse 7, where we're told that, that Christ, the Christ would be oppressed and that word actually does mean harassed or tyrannized. But the thing was, Jesus opened, we're told Jesus would not open his mouth. Further, if we read in 1 Peter chapter 2, if we look there, beginning in verses, verse 21, we're told, For you've been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And here's the key, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. 
that word reviled refers to being vilified. So Jesus was vilified, he was tyrannized, and he was harassed. My experiences are are, are nowhere near what, what Jesus suffered. And there's an example here for, for me to follow. And there's an example for all of us to follow. It's tough, but we're told that, that we, shouldn't, we shouldn't return that harassment. It's hard. It's hard when we're told things that, that hurt us. Continuing on, while suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die, die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds, you were healed. We take this time to remember that sacrifice. And as we do so, let's, let's think about all that Christ did for us. Let's go to God in prayer for the bread. Righteous Father, we thank you for your son and for his willingness to, to go to the cross in our place. We thank you for this memorial feast that gives us the opportunity to consider the body of your son. As we partake, we pray that we do so in a way that's pleasing and acceptable in your sight. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's also consider the cup. Father, again, we, we come to you and we thank you for this memorial to remember the blood of your son. We know that by coming in, into contact with that blood, we can be made, made pure. We can have our sins washed away. Father, your son suffered in our stead and bore the, the pain of a death that we deserved. It's far more than we can comprehend, but we're grateful for that sacrifice. As we partake of this cup, we Pray that we do so in a way that's acceptable in your sight. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Before the fall now. 
Afternoon, oh, evening. Uh, t- tonight's scripture reading is Psalms chapter 17, verses 1 to 9. 
Hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer, which is not from deceitful lips. Let my vindication come from your presence. Let your eyes look on the things that are upright. You have tested my heart. You have visited me in the night. You have tried me and have found nothing. I have purposed that my, li- that my mouth shall not transgress. Concerning the works of men, by the word of your lips, I have kept away from the paths of the destroyer. Uphold my steps in your paths, that my footsteps may not slip. I have called upon you, for you will hear me, O God. Incline your ear to me and hear my speech. Show your marvelous loving kindness by your right hand, O you who save those who trust in you from those who rise up against them. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings from the wicked who oppress me, from my deadly enemies who who surround me. Now see, if everybody welcomed me up to preach like that, now that'd be a great life, I'm just telling you. (laughs) I didn't get the outlines out there in time, but the reason I call attention to them is the material, the type of material that we use in the connect groups is what I put on the back of the sermon outline on Sunday night. So you have, if you want to use this lesson all week long for your personal study, I put those questions there on the back, so, um, and, and feel free if you want to go back there and get one while we're talking, that's fine, but you can get one on the way out and have that for your material if you would like to do so for the week. Today we are, we've been playing a game, hide and seek. There are people who hide For an outcome that is not good. People like we talked about this morning who because of guilt, because of failure, because of irresponsibility, all kinds of those things, people hide away from God. And it is in that that hiding that they experience something bad because In that hiding, people create their own hiding places. And the results of that kind of hiding are not good. While God is seeking them, if they stay in that hiding place, created by themselves, they're not going to be happy. It's not going to be good. Now, that's how God looks. From his lofty height, he sees us hiding away from him, even though he is seeking us. Now tonight, we're going to look at it from man's viewpoint, mankind's viewpoint of this game of hide and seek. The difference is some people hide in a place that does not give a good outcome, while others hide in a place that has positive effect in their lives. That's what we have done. That's what we call people to do. Think with me about this idea. We begin first by noticing that from our vantage point, the game is different. From our vantage point, the game should be called Seek and Hide. Because the seeking comes first. The mentality that says, I want to hide in God. I don't want to hide in a place of my own invention because it is not good. I don't make good choices. I don't go to a place that is positive when I hide on my own from guilt. But if I want to hide in God, I must seek first. God has promised he always has been and always will be able to be found. Acts 17 and 27, that we should seek the Lord and grope after him. We might find him, though he is not very far from every one of us. 
Those who seek, Jesus said, will find. If I'm looking for the hiding place of God and I seek it, I will find it. Because he says it can be found. But I must be a meek person. Seek the Lord, all you meek of the world. Seek out his justice. Seek his righteousness. And it may be that you will be saved. Zephaniah 2 and verse 3. We are people who must be meek to seek. Meekness, of course, is strength under control. See, if I go find my own hiding place, I'm not in control. But if I control my desire, my urge to run, and I put it in control and let God be the one I run to, I'm seeking Him, that's meekness. That's where God wants me to be. And it must be a, a full-hearted idea. Before they went into the promised land, Moses said in Deuteronomy 4 and verse 29, when you get to that land, now in that text, he is telling them before they even get to the promised land, he is telling them that one day they are going to follow the gods of all the people around them and God's going to send them off and be scattered among the nations. That's what he says. But then he says in verse 29, but... If you will seek me there, if you will seek me, you will find me. If you do it with your whole heart and your whole soul, I have to be invested in it. The seeking that God requires, I make a full investment in that seeking to find his hiding place. But here is something we need to keep in mind it is time sensitive. Isaiah 55 states it in such a way that it sounds like it contradicted what Paul said in Acts 17. Isaiah said, Seek the Lord while he may be found, seek him while he is near. You mean, it might be that he can't be found. It might be that he'll be far away someday. That's not what Paul said. Obviously, he's talking from the perspective that we have. Maybe you have stories that fit the time-sensitive idea. I have one. I have a story that hurts in this time-sensitive idea. Back in St. Louis, Arnold, Missouri, had a family with whom we were close. They had a 12-year-old daughter and a 16-year-old son. The dad had never obeyed the gospel. I'd talked to him many times. He had cancer. He called me on Friday and he said, I'm going in for a cancer treatment over the weekend. Monday, I want to come to your house or to your office and talk about my spiritual condition. He had a heart attack and died on Sunday. From that day to this day, his daughter has been an adopted daughter of mine. I get a Father's Day card every year. But there's a man who did not seek the Lord while he could be found. Because once we leave this world, you can't find him now. We are seekers to hide in God's place. Therefore, from our perspective, the game should be called seek and hide. 
Now, all of us who are children of God, all of us who were seeking, have been hidden away in God. And I was thinking about this concept, and I thought about and went online to find out the details of the Federal Witness Protection. And I looked at the qualifications to be in witness protection. They fit perfectly with people who hide in God under His witness protection program. Notice how they fit. Because if you're a child of God, we are in witness protection with Him. According to that program, when you go into the witness protection program, you get a brand new identity. We have been buried with Him in baptism. Like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Romans 6 and 4. Our identity has changed. We don't have the same life we had before. And going into God's hiding place, the identity changes. When they change that person's identity, they give that person a new name. Now they said you can keep your first name. When I was reading about it, you can't keep your last name. When we go into hiding in God's witness protection program, we get a brand new name. Acts 11 and verse 26, the disciples were called Christians First in Antioch. And James said in James chapter 2 about the rich, do they not blaspheme that holy name by which you are called? You got a brand new name. We did. And just like that program, you get a brand new place of residence. Paul told the Colossians in chapter 1 and verse 13 that he has delivered us and conveyed us into the kingdom of his son. Delivered us from this world and conveyed us into his kingdom. You have a brand new place of residence when we are in God's witness protection. They said they make these people sign a contract. And the contract says, you will stay out of trouble. You commit a crime, you are out of the program. We've signed a contract. Because God said in 2 Corinthians 6 and 17 and 18, come out from among them. Be separate, says the Lord. I'll be your father. You'll be my sons and daughters. When we went into witness protection with God, we signed a contract that says we're coming out of the world. We're going to stay out of that world. We're going to stay out of trouble. Oh, and by the way, when you're in witness protection, your contract says, when it is time, you will testify in court. Because they're in witness protection because of a problem. They saw something. They know something. They're out to get them. Put them in witness protection. But you're coming to court and you're going to testify The same is with us. Be ready always to give an answer to those who ask you a reason for the hope that is in you 
with meekness and fear? 1 Peter 3 and 15. We signed a contract. The contract says to be in God's witness protection program, you're going to testify. You're going to acknowledge in public. You're not going to testify in private. It'll be in public. In God's hiding place. And I did not know that people in witness protection with the government get paid. I had no idea. I've seen programs where they get them jobs and all of that, but they actually get a stipend, apparently, from the government. Well, you know, in God's witness protection program, the pay is out of this world. Paul said, I've finished the course, I've kept the faith, therefore, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord God, the righteous judge, will give to me in that day and not to me only, but to all those who have loved his appearing. The pay out of this world. You and I we're in witness protection with God if we have sought Him out because He will hide us. Now in this hiding place of God, it is a hiding place covered in blood. In Exodus 12, as God was getting ready to pull his people out of Egyptian bondage. On that last night, he said, Now you kill a lamb and you eat it with a staff in your hand and shoes on your feet, ready to take a journey. And you take some of that blood and you put it above the door. And on the sides of the door, and you stay in that house, and I will pass right over you. The hiding place of God is covered in blood. Covered in the blood of Jesus for you and me. But blood in God's Use of it tells us why his hiding place is covered in blood. It's covered in atoning blood. In Exodus 30 and verse 10, God said, And I have given to Aaron the blood of the sin offering to pour on the mercy seat as an atonement for your souls. Because Leviticus 17, 11 said, life is in the blood. The blood that covers the hiding place of God atones for all of the stuff that caused us to run away and hide in the first place. The guilt, the failure, the irresponsibility. When we leave our hiding place and we come to his hiding place, the blood atones. It's a liberating blood. In Zechariah 9 and verse 11, God said to his people in captivity, because of the blood of your covenant, I will free the people. The hiding places that we create for ourselves are actually prisons. But the hiding place that God gives 
is freeing. Why would we choose that hiding place over this hiding place? Why would not the word of God be enough for us to say, I'll take this one. I'll be free here instead of in bondage over there. And the hiding place of Jesus is covered with blood, the purifying blood. In Hebrews 9 and verse 11, the writer was reminding the people that all things are purified, but not without blood. The shedding of blood purifies everything. When he finished, Moses, finished reading the law, they took a hyssop, dipped it in the blood, and sprinkled it on the word. And then he took the hyssop and dipped it in blood, and all the people who were gathered there, he just did like this and slung it everywhere, symbolically saying, through this blood, you're purified. Look at Psalm 17 as we close. Listen to what the psalmist says. Let me put it this way. The psalmist says, in the new game of seek and hide, there are only three rules. Three rules. Number one, verses one and two. Desire to be in that hiding place. If you don't want to be there, he's not going to force you. If you don't look for it, he's not going to knock you down and make you come inside. The psalmist said, give ear to my prayer. He wanted this place. Number two. To get into the hiding place of God, you got to pass the entrance exam. Verse 3, the heart has been tested. You've tried me and found nothing. You purposed with my mouth. I have kept away from the paths of the destroyer. Uphold my paths so that my foot will not slip. I called upon you. Incline your ear to me. You got to pass the entrance exam to get into God's hiding place. But finally, he says, verses 7 through 9, you got to stay there. You got to stay there. Hide me, O Lord. Under the shadow of your wing. There are so many times that people just can't be satisfied with God's hiding place. And sometimes we think the ones that we create are better and we run over there to them for a while. And the only reason we run is because in that moment, we're racked with guilt. We failed in some way. Irresponsibility is creeping in. And I'm just running from the situation. But my hiding places are not any good compared to his. And when the psalmist said, hide me away, O Lord. He was recognizing the fact that this place is the best. Now you remember playing hide and seek. In fact, the college students and the young adults have played it many times. In this building, in some of their events. And you know what they talk about? I'll tell you where the best place is. That's what they say. Now, I can tell you where some of them are. You know, if you go in that room right there, 
go to the back of that room, there's a little bitty door. If you can get in that door and get back in there and avoid all the spiders, <laughs> that's a good hiding place. Apparently there's a good hiding place somewhere where you can actually get inside a cabinet and close the door to the cabinet. All you got to do is watch these people over here and figure out which ones have been where. They know where those hiding places are. And if the next generation comes along and asks them, I bet they're going to say, ah, I'll tell you where the hiding places are. Spiritually speaking, where's the best hiding place? Where do you want to go? Where can you go with God's protection to have everything you need, everything you could ever want spiritually? Well, it certainly includes his church. It certainly includes a Christian family. It certainly includes Christian activities with brethren. But it's all God's hiding place, and it's the best. And we try sometimes to do what we think is best, but His is. Tonight, if you're looking for a place to hide, a place to be free in hiding, a place to be protected fully while hiding, a place where you can rest while hiding, a place where your mind can be at peace because the blood has washed it all away. If you haven't found it yet, I can tell you about it. We can help you. We can welcome you in. Immerse you into Christ where that hiding place exists. But in this hiding place of His church, when we have trouble, it is here that we find support and courage, where we find a place to get a hug, to get advice, and to have prayer. We come to God's hiding place if you need to tonight. Let's stand and sing this song together. Hide me away, O Lord. just a few announcements before we dismiss this evening. First and foremost, on our prayer list, we have a prayer request for Wesley McFadden. He is having uh, neck surgery, uh, so we definitely want to keep him in our prayers. In other announcements, we have to parents and children, our memory verse tree is officially ready for, excuse me, for participation. This new program encourages children and families to memorize Bible facts and verses which are listed on the tree in the lobby.
Children will continue to recite random memory verses to Melinda Dolan, Haley, and Andrea Hunt. There are a helpful list of Bible verses in the folders and baskets around the tree if needed. Bible facts can also be recited to Tina Williams, Carol Moores, and Greta Blankenship. Children will receive incentives when they do so. We are excited about this new learning opportunity for our youth. Please encourage your children to participate. Thank you again, Andrea Hunt. She also has a note that says, this program is geared toward preschool through fifth grade. However, middle and high school uh, children are welcome to the challenge. I have a note from Daryl Adkins. He wants to publicly thank those who helped him load furniture uh, onto his trailer on Saturday. The help was much appreciated. Thank you to all of those who have added to the freshman's midterm boxes so far. If you're still planning to add, whether, uh, to add things, whether snacks or gifts or cards, uh, please have those placed in the boxes found in the foyer uh, by October 1st. They will be passed out the week of October 1st. See Haley with any questions. In youth group news, Tuesday, September 26th, this week, there will be a girls' Bible study at the Small Woods. If you have any questions, please see Lindsay or Nick on that. Adopt-a-student assignments are posted in the office as well as adult packets for those who signed up. Inside the packet is information about the program and student information sheets to have your student or their parent fill out. Lastly, we'll do the, the slide announcements. Tomorrow, September 25th uh, at 2 p.m. is the installment, next installment of the, the RCC Women's Book Club. Uh, it'll be at Dolly Lynch's house. Uh, the book is Everybody Always by Bob Goff. Also Tuesday night, uh, the 26th at 6 p.m. is Ladies' Night Out. It is at Better Burgers and More here in Richmond. Uh, so all ladies are encouraged to, to attend that. Wednesday, our college dinner will be a charcuterie dinner here at the building, the 27th at 5.30. Uh, team 2, College Meal Team 2, is in charge of that. And finally, we have upcoming soon the Coger Farm Church Hayride on October 14th. Uh, so we, uh, it's always a good time to have, so we encourage everyone to make plans to attend that. There's nothing else. We will be dismissed in prayer. God, we love you. We thank you so much for this opportunity we have to come into your house, to sing praises to your name, to gather around your table, to hear your word. God, we ask that you help us this week to take what we've learned this week, this, this day here at worship, and that we can put it into our hearts and our minds and keep it ever fresh, that we can apply it to our lives and we can strive to bring others to you. God, we're mindful of those who cannot be with us for various reasons, whether it be physical illness or spiritual issues or emotional issues. God, we ask that you bless them as only you can. God, we're mindful of those who are grieving the loss of a loved one at this time. We know it's a difficult process to go through, and we guess that you grant them peace and comfort, God, that we know only comes through you. Go with us as we leave here. Take us home safely and out into this world uh, this week. Forgive us when we fail you, because we do fail you every day. We're so thankful that we have that opportunity to ask for forgiveness and that we have the knowledge, God, and the hope that one day we will be united with you one day in heaven. God, we ask that you continue to bless us and keep us ever safe as we leave. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.